Good morning, everybody. It's my very great pleasure to be leading our service this morning. And we will start with an acknowledgement of country. Today is the first day of NAIDOC week. And this week, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are calling us to listen. To listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Christian leaders, to listen to the land, acknowledging that it always was and always will be. And through this deep listening, we're invited to connect, to acknowledge and to take action. As a first step of that acknowledging, we acknowledge that wherever we are in Australia today, we are sitting, standing or lying on Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander land. And thanks for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders past, present and emerging and we pray for deep listening from all Australians throughout NAIDOC week and beyond. <coughs> Into this place of worship, we bring the hopes and needs of all who find themselves in the dark places of the world. The grieving, the sick, the abused and the forgotten. Into this place of worship, we bring the hopes and dreams of those who have lost their purpose and vision the rejected, the fallen, the disappointed and the discouraged. Into this place of worship, we bring the hopes and courage of all who serve and uplift others. Lord, I come to the light. 
confess that I'm wretched in blood. Lord, bring the breaking. Please hear my cry. Shake all that can be shaken and heal the land that's dry. Lord, I come to the land, confess that I need you. Lord, I come to the land, confess that I'm poor. Lord, I come to the light, confess that I'm wretched and done. Lord, I come to the light, confess that I need you. Lord, I come to the light, confess that I'm poor. Lord, I come to the light, confess that I'm wretched and blind. Wretched and blind. Confess that I need you. The first reading this morning is from Wisdom of Solomon, verses, chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. Wisdom is radiant and unfading, and she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. He who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty for he will find her sitting at his gates. To fix one's thought on her is perfect understanding, and he who is vigilant on her account will soon be free from care, because she goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their paths and meets them in every thought. In this is the word of God. Uh, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came along also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. We stand at the crossing, Holy God. Arms, hearts, souls, full of the burdens the gods of this world have placed on us. You remove them, throw them to one side, taking us by the hand to lead us into your kingdom. As we turn to you in our despair, Holy Friend, 
you come and fill our emptiness with the holy oil of your compassion, so we might always be ready to serve those who come to us. Holy wisdom, you would not leave us uninformed of God's love for us. So you whisper in our ears of wonders beyond imagination. You remove the blindfolds from our eyes so we may behold the grace flowing all around us. You open our hearts to the family God has given us. God in community, holy in one. Hear us as we pray as Jesus. Jesus teaches us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Shepherd, on this Sunday closest to Armistice Day, we pray for your people of every land. We pray for those in countries torn by war and conflict, whether they are natives of that country or they're trying to bring about peace and stability. For those who continue to suffer the effects of past wars, for all peacekeepers, aid and relief workers. Do not let us forget those of this and other lands who have paid with their lives the shocking cost of war and strengthen us that we may be ready to make the sacrifices required for peace. Loving Shepherd, we pray for your church and for all that follow you. We pray for all leaders of churches, for those who are pastors to your people, for all who serve you in places of loneliness and hardship. Help us to work for the time when all your followers will be able to eat together at the table you prepare for us and together proclaim your love to the world. Loving Shepherd, we pray for all those you entrust to our care. We pray for our families and our friends, for those who must depend on others for their welfare and for those whose constant responsibility for care for others particularly those who continue to minister to victims of COVID-19 and those who are working to find both effective treatments and vaccines. Help us to make a community where we're all are known by name, where we all know the experience of being accepted and valued as individuals. Love and Shepherd, we pray for all in need of your comfort and balm. We pray for all who are lost, lonely or confused, for the sick and for the dying, for all who provide medical care, for social workers and pastoral care workers. Help us to bring consolation to all who suffer and the assurance that in sorrow and in pain, you will not abandon them. Loving Shepherd, you laid down your life for your sheep. We give thanks for the courage and selflessness of all those who have served and are serving Australia in times of war, and particularly those who have given their lives that others may live in peace. May we, like them, offer our lives in love for others. Good Shepherd, in your mercy, hear these our prayers. Amen. The lectionary readings set for today, in theory, are supposed to help us start our preparations for Advent. At a quick glance in the gospel, Jesus' parable of the bridesmaids and virgins is a reminder that God is always coming to us and that we need to be alert and watchful so that we don't miss God's presence and activity in our lives. In the Psalms and the wisdom reading, there is the celebration of living with wisdom, of remembering God's gracious acts on behalf of God's people and of trusting God's help when you bring those ideas together, we get a single cohesive theme of hope and trust in God's coming and God's activity in our lives and in our world, past, present and future. We're inspired and challenged to live out this faith and hope by being alert, 
mindful and wise. Our hope in Christ then forms the basis for wise and abundant living. But I think we need to go a little bit deeper than just a surface reading, particularly with the text from Matthew. So before we get into the gospel itself, I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about the concept of wisdom. I first knowingly encountered the concept of wisdom when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons in my late teens. In D&D, wisdom and intelligence are two separate attributes. The way to differentiate them is to look at the way that they are used. Intelligence is used to support old knowledge skills, religion, history, nature, plus investigation. Wisdom is used to support animal handling, medicine, perception, survival. Intelligence is something that supports slow thought and consideration. And the knowledge skills involve pure recall of applicable knowledge and investigation as the methodical search in an area or a concept. And wisdom skills are more in intuitive about an ability to pick out important things on site and react sensibly to highly varied situations. Intelligence is about being able to learn and apply the learning that is taught to you. Wisdom is about being able to learn and apply knowledge gained through experience and sharpened intuition. So how does that approach to wisdom sit with the description of wisdom in our reading from the Apocrypha? Apart from the fact that wisdom is female, concept that I love and have preached on before, I want us to use our wisdom and apply the concept of learning and application of knowledge gained through experience through our reading of the text from Matthew. As many of you know, I'm an English teacher. One of the things that English teachers are encouraged to teach is the concept of critical literacy. Developing an ability to actively read and interrogate a text in a manner that promotes a deeper understanding of socially constructed concepts like power or inequality or injustice. When we read critically, we ask questions of the text. We question the attitudes, values and beliefs of the author of a text to better understand the hidden agendas within the text. So we'll do a critical reading of the text from Matthew. Now, side note to that, um, the NRSV translates the Greek word parthenios as bridesmaid. The NIV translates it as virgin. These words are not interchangeable. When I read the parable, my intuition sounds major alarm bells. To understand why the passage makes me uncomfortable, I decided to interrogate the text with a few questions, some of which come from Glenn Monson's book, Afflicting the Comfortable, Comforting the Afflicted. Question one is how does the word function in this text. This parable is commonly accepted as a call for readiness. Similar calls in the preceding chapter provide that context. It's a call to be ready for the coming of the Son of Man. It's a call to those who have already been invited to the wedding feast, to those who, have known, who are known to the bridegroom and the bride. And that's why the final line from the bridegroom I do not know you is absolutely shocking. Question two, how is the word not functioning in this text? I really struggle to find Jesus and his gospel in this text. I know Jesus is telling us this story, but I can't find him in it. One example of the lack of Jesus' gospel in this text 
is the point where the bridegroom finally turns up and the bridesmaids slash virgins wake up. Five of them have spare oil and five don't. The five who have run out turn to the other bridesmaids who are their sisters or their friends or their family and say, please share. Please give us some oil for our lamps to keep them burning. But the wise ones say, no, there's not enough to go around. No, we have ours and we're going to the party. You didn't plan ahead. And that's your problem that you have to solve for yourself. I've heard and read teaching on this parable that says I should be like one of the wise ones and have extra oil for my lamp. Extra faith, extra preparedness. But when I look at this parable through a question about how the word is not functioning in this text, I don't want to be anything like the wise virgins because in Matthew 5 verses 40 to 41, Jesus teaches, if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. At the heart of Jesus' gospel, lies a generous God who invites us to generosity, even at great costs to ourselves. So what about those young women left waiting outside? They act. They do not sit idly by and give up. They race off in the middle of the night and somehow find someone to provide them with more oil. In the middle of the night, their lamps were already out, so they find their way through dark streets to get what they need and then they return. They return to the house of the bride and they knock on the door, equipped and ready to help the party, but the way is shut. The other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. How does that fit in any way, shape or form with what Jesus teaches in Matthew 7? Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Except in this case. Question three, with whom are we identifying in this text? As I already said, I have no desire to identify with the wise virgins. The example and the behaviour of those so-called wise ones to me is abhorrent. There's almost an air of smug self-satisfaction as they go off to the party. We got in because we are wise. Do they not care about those left behind? those outside, those who are excluded, their sisters, their friends? How often has your heart broken with the knowledge that someone you love might be excluded from the loving kingdom of God because they did not have enough faith, enough knowledge, enough commitment? Is this the God that we encounter in the scriptures, in Jesus? The wise ones appear to me much more like Pharisees. Those folk Jesus often criticises. Final question. Whose voices and whose stories are excluded from this text? Whatever translation for Parthenios you prefer, five of these young women are excluded from the text. The Greek word used to describe them is marai, which translates as dull, stupid, foolish, or even moron. These are the people whose voices are excluded from the text. 
the people about whom the bridegroom says, I do not know you. Given that women of this time and place typically married in their early teens, the Parthenios could be as young as 10 or 12. These young women asked for help, which was denied to them. They then went off in the dark and sourced oil for their lamps and still their sisters didn't intercede to get them into the wedding feast. These young women are incredibly resourceful and yet they are still excluded. Inside are a group who refuse to do what Jesus taught, share generously, even if it means your own suffering. Outside is a group who are experiencing reject rejection, despite their last ditch efforts to knock at the door, which Jesus said would be opened. How do we make sense of this? Now, parables make a central point, and they will move heaven and the narrative earth to do that. So the unreasonable act of exclusion is what allows the storyteller to give Jesus his final line, keep awake for you know neither the day nor the hour. That final line implies that we ought to perhaps be thinking about the feast that is to come and not just some average wedding feast. But that makes things worse, not better. Because now, Inclusion in the kingdom of God is determined by a gatekeeper who locks the doors against those who are not sufficiently pruned, against those who asked for help and were refused. When I finish reading this parable, I am struck by how important the separating and the excluding is to it. This parable can't work without separating and excluding someone. The young women are separated from each other by the amount of oil in their lamps, and they do not offer aid to each other. Those who arrive late have the door shut in their faces, though it is the middle of the night and they are alone on the street. Beyond that, this story of separation and exclusion aims its energy at women. I am suspicious of such stories, and I have come to distrust them. There is danger in narrative schemes that only work if women are made to be morons. There is danger in any theological structure that imagines that separation and exclusion are the essence of faithfulness, and it is time that we pointed these dangers out. I notice at the end of the bigger story of which this parable forms one small part, Jesus no longer does his work by separating and excluding. When he appears to his gathered disciples, some wise enough to worship and some foolish enough to doubt, in Matthew 28, which is only three chapters from this scene, he does not slam the door in the face of the doubters. Instead, he sends the whole mixed group out to baptise and to teach, and he explicitly promises to be with all of them, wise and foolish, worshippers and doubters throughout the ages. I wonder if he apologised to the young women that he called morons. So, after all of that, how does this parable from Matthew prepare us for Advent? If you want to, you can use this parable to remind you about the importance of being prepared, about how a life well lived is a life that is spent preparing for the abrupt arrival of the reign of God. I think there's a lot more to it than that. I think that this parable prepares us for Advent by asking us to re-examine what inclusion and exclusion mean and what we as the church are prepared to do about it. As we prepare for Advent in 2020, I encourage you to think about these questions. What stories are you listening to? What stories are you telling? 
How do you attend to your own story? Where have you experienced being lost in a story and being found? How might God be inviting you to look at your story and the story of Advent with new eyes? Amen.